Hello everyone. Welcome to a webinar hosted by the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. My name is Amy Robertson. I'm the science coordinator for the partnership. And we're very pleased today to have Dr. Scott Bonar, professor and researcher at the University of Arizona, who's going to be presenting to us about the rarest fish in the world, native desert fishes of the American Southwest, and the response to a changing climate. This webinar uh, was organized by one of our teams in the Desert LCC. We have critical management question teams. And this particular team, number four, is focused on uh, creating a greater understanding of the physiological impacts of climate change on species. But I think this webinar is also of great interest to many of our other teams and groups, and obviously to all of you. So thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bonar, for, for sharing your work with us. And I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you for the presentation. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Amy. Uh, and again, I really appreciate your interest and the opportunity to uh, talk with you folks about a, a subject that uh, I'm very passionate about. Um, also, what I'm going to talk about today is I'm one small part of this research. I'm going to be covering some of the research that's been going on in different areas. Um, obviously, I'm going to miss some. Um, and it's going to be focused on research that we're doing in our lab here. So uh, for those of you who I missed, I apologize. There's a lot of wonderful stuff going on out there. Plus, um, the graduate students I get a chance to work with and our collaborators, I'll talk about their projects. Uh, mistakes are mine, and the credit uh, largely is theirs, and so I want to pass that on. So we'll see who these folks are when we move through this, and then I'll have more information at the end if you want more information. Um, the objectives of the talk, we'll just start right out in front. Um, I want to provide an overview of the wider range of fishes in arid lands. And the uh, integral part is why do we want to protect them? Uh, we run into a lot of people who say, why the heck should I care about that particular fish, that little minnow or this thing? And so I'm going to talk with you a little bit about that it's important to say why you do it, uh, especially when you're talking with the public. Um, I'm also going to describe what is expected to happen with these fishes and their environments in a changing climate. Um, changing climate is not a matter of debate anymore. It's happening. Um, although a lot of folks don't think it is, 97% um, of the scientists uh, believe that it is, and 9 per, or, or percent of the studies, depending on who you look at, which is a vast majority. So we're going to talk about what is expected to happen to these animals and their habitat. Um, and then we're also going to... Uh, uh, to discuss strategies and research needs to manage the effect of climate change on southwestern fishes and other aquatic organisms. There's lots of bad news about climate change, but the really good news is, unlike, say, an asteroid coming to hit the Earth or something, it's stuff that we can do something about if we can just mobilize and get folks to take action. The science is not beyond us to take care of this. And so um, as we move through this, I'll urge you to, as scientists, to become involved in getting this information out, and making sure that we're communicating with the public. Um, just a little bit about my background. Um, I, was, uh, I grew up in the large lake and river country of southern Indiana, Kentucky. I came out and got a degree of, 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 uh, in fisheries at the University of Washington in Seattle. I got a Ph.D. up there. And so I've been around waters all my life. I love water and uh, been scuba diving all over the world, and I thoroughly enjoy that. And so... Uh, then um, I got a position. I headed down here to Arizona, Southern California, and Nevada, and here's what awaited me. And so I'm sitting here going, oh, my gosh, what kind of aquatics do we have here? And so uh, I can tell you, after spending some time here, I was wonderfully impressed and surprised. The aquatic communities here and the fish communities here are amazing, and I think when you talk to the biologists here, they'll attest to that. And so what do we mean by this? Well, you have to have some pretty unique fishes that are able to deal with some of these rampaging turbine waters, uh, these deep canyons. You have habitats that range over to Death Valley, where uh, some, of the, uh, uh, some of these springs are, uh, uh, are hotter uh, than 100 degrees Fahrenheit and seawater. Uh, sea uh, or the salinity is five times higher than seawater. You have uh, beautiful trout streams up in the mountains and unique species of trout. And then you have environments that uh, have uh, rampaging floods. And uh, 
this is just right behind our house. You can kind of see uh, some of the environments. Uh, uh, water in the desert isn't a matter of it being there. It's also a matter of when. So uh, it's a matter of timing. So water can be here in some places and not there in others. And so this creates a, a very unique fauna of animals. And so let's take a look at some of the uniqueness of fauna uh, that are down here. Some of these fishes have evolved um, humps to be able to hold themselves in these turbid, uh, turbid waters, these high rushing currents. You don't need a great big eye, so you have a small eye. You have a strong tail to hold you in the current. Um, we have the largest minnow species in North America here, the Colorado pike minnow. Historical records of these fishes going up to about six feet long. Um, we have uh, species that, uh, like the long fin dace, that lives in hot, drying streams. If you go out to a, a stream uh, during the day that's lined with cottonwoods, you'll find the flow is either low or non-existent in some streams. And that's because of all the photosynthesis taking place. Well, when you go out at night, it's a whole different story because that stream, uh, suddenly the photosynthesis is not taking place in the cottonwoods. The stream is flowing, and these fishes are around darting everywhere. So it's a change just from night to day. Again, here are some of the species uh, that I talked about in Death Valley, the cotton ball marsh pupfish. This uh, unique animal has evolved to be able to handle salinities, again, five times higher than seawater, and then also wa water temperatures of over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So just amazing adaptation. And we have some of the most southern trouts in North America. We have uh, uh, folks in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Arizona Game and Fish, uh, uh, New Mexico, uh, some of the folks over there in the U.S. Forest Service working on these uh, wonderful southern trout species that are unique in these uh, high uh, sky areas separated uh, by vast tracts of arid land from other waters. Well, uh, some of the things that we have to ask ourselves when managing these fish populations are how are they doing? And they're not doing very well. Um, the last account was given, uh, this, was, this was kind of dated, but it just does give an example of these things are not doing very well at all. And of 150 uh, full species included in the fish fauna of the West, this was uh, what's uh, uh, put forth by Lee in 1980. Uh, 122 taxa west of the Rocky Mountains disappeared or threatened or endangered. Now, those include species and subspecies, but we're talking about a large percentage of our animals here are not doing very well. And um, what I tell students uh, is that uh, managing desert fishes, um, you ha might have a, uh, an area that's uh, Right here, we have a spring, and this is over in the Mojave Desert. And this spring, at one time, lived the entire population of Mojave to each other, a very small spring. So um, it's kind of like managing terrestrial populations in the South Pacific, on South Pacific islands. It's very similar to that, only we're managing aquatic islands. And uh, just like the South Pacific islands with the dodo bird, the Galapagos tortoise, and the various other Galapagos species, things like that, we have species that are very unique and highly at risk. Well, bring into that, you've got all the stressors that are on uh, these species, and now bring in climate change into the mix. It's been going on for the last few decades. And we're seeing more and more uh, interest in the press and the public to do something about this. And um, we expect, uh, here are some of the projections. You've probably seen these before if you've looked at other seminars. But uh, we're looking at increases between 4 and 10 degrees Fahrenheit in the southwest. These are global impacts. And uh, it's not only the temperatures are going to go up, but as we all know, drought is happening as well. We're seeing California water restrictions. We're seeing drought in uh, unprecedented levels across the southwest. And this is like uh, in the Pacific. Uh, the, same, the same sort of stuff. Uh, over there, it's an opposite problem. The islands there in the Pacific with rising water levels due to ice melting are uh, slowly, uh, uh, some of them are slowly disappearing or their, lay their uh, 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 shorelines are, uh, are receding. Well, here it's the same thing, only that here it's lack of water. Our little stream systems, our springs and what have you, are drying, and this is going to be a, a problem for the future. And um, when anybody uh, uh, questions the lack of problems with climate change or, uh, uh, or hey, it's not going to really be an impact to me, they really need to read their history books 
And uh, when you look at, uh, you don't have to look far for this information. But um, now more and more, uh, you're having a scientist who are also historians and uh, past uh, um, uh, folks looking at past climates. And you're saying that there were many, many civilizations, and we're talking advanced civilizations, advanced societies, when they didn't, when they didn't pay attention to their, um, uh, their water systems uh, and during times of drought, uh, the societies collapsed because they did not consider water uh, either important or they were unable to deal with the uh, uh, increasing problems of water loss. And what really surprised me about some of these is not only were there things like uh, the Anastasi uh, up in the, in the Southwest that we were familiar with, but uh, you had, uh, and these are articles appearing in Science, and uh, the proceedings of the Academy of National Sciences, things like Jamestown, uh, the, the early settlements, and Roanoke. Um, some of these settlements collapsed or, or were right on the edge for a while, and they said they had coincided, these collapses coincided with uh, a decades-long drought, which, uh, resulted for, uh, which resulted in crop failures and problems in water quality, or in the case of the Roman Empire, resulted in invasions. Uh, sometimes from areas where people couldn't grow their food or they could not grow enough food in the Roman Empire. So I thought this was really surprising and interesting, but it shows us that we need to pay attention to history. And uh, bottom line is climate change. Those other ones, if you look at that, that uh, those are regional droughts. Now we've got a big one we've got to worry about, uh, at least in our area and some of the other areas around the country uh, with the climate change. So uh, one might ask the question, well, with limited water, why protect desert fish and their habitats? Why would we do that? And uh, so this is, uh, uh, you biologists and managers, um, to be effective to protect these species, and not just the fish, but a lot of the other species too, we must be able to articulate to the public their value. Now that's to the public and to, to uh, decision make makers for, for maximum effectiveness. Um, my uh, personal philosophy is, I think there are many reasons, uh, or not, it's not my personal philosophy, but there are many reasons why these uh, animals are important, and we, we don't know what's going to strike somebody as, uh, hey, that's an important reason to keep it around. So uh, we need to expand our arguments. And so let's talk a little bit about desert fishes as an example. Well, first off, uh, riparian habitats are critically important to most desert wildlife. Um, their importance is considerably disproportionate to their area. They're only 0.4, like in Arizona, only 0.4% of the land is riparian area. But contrast that to 80% of the vertebrates in Arizona spend some portion of their life cycle in riparian areas. So these are critically important for our fish and wildlife populations. Again, not just our fish, but wildlife, uh, terrestrial wildlife that needs to use these areas. Well, to protect um, entire ecosystems, all species are important for ecosystem function, and um, uh, their relative importance may vary. Uh, for instance, um, I've heard it compared to rivets on an airplane. If you have uh, a, a particular species, um, it may be like a rivet in your seat. If that species goes extinct, it might be like taking a rivet out of your seat on an airplane. But then again, it might be like taking a rivet out of what's holding the engine on. And so there the plane would crash, the ecosystem would crash. The thing is, is a lot of times we don't know ahead of time how critically important some of these species might be. And they are canaries in the coal mine. These things start to disappear. Um, it means impact to humans later on too. And so it's not just a matter of humans are more important than animals or, or animals are more important than humans. We're all in this together. And uh, 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 as uh, Phil Peaster used to say, the most selfish thing we can do as a, uh, a, a human community is selfishly protect our uh, animals, plants, fish, and that sort of thing. Well, we also make the point that desert fish are a part of the heritage of the Southwest. Um, just like uh, a, a bighorn sheep or a puma, desert fish are critically important in our heritage, in our history. The Apache trout is the Arizona state fish. You'll see uh, petroglyphs and pictographs. Uh, the Hoakon, the Mogollon, uh, some of the ancient cultures that have desert fish in there, 
And then some of our historical accounts uh, of our communities. We used to fish desert fish in the past. And so uh, they are an important part of our heritage and our history. If we lose that, that's gone. Uh, plus, um, uh, these desert fish and intact riparian areas contribute substantially to our economy. Um, let's take a look at this. This might seem surprising, these uh, uh, native desert fishes and some of their habitats. But let's take a look specifically. And this is an important argument for decision makers to know when you're uh, comparing these things. In 2011, $18.3 billion was spent on tourism in Arizona. We're going to just take a year, okay? This is the Arizona Office of Tourism. Now, here was a surprising thing. When you look at the top tourist attractions in Arizona, this is the top natural attraction and the top private attraction. It's not a casino. It's not a golf course. It's nothing like that. The top natural attraction, not surprisingly, was the Grand Canyon. The top private attraction was Tempe Town Lake. That surprised the heck out of me. Well, the thing is, is both these things are bodies of water. And so you hurt your economy when you get rid of these surface bodies of water. Um, when you look at um, revenue generated, and this is from the National Survey of Fishing, Hunting, and Wildlife Associated Recreation. Uh, we'll just pick a year here, 2006. Revenue generated by expenditures in Arizona alone on fishing, hunting, and wildlife washing was almost $2 billion. And uh, fishing was almost a billion. So uh, you, you need the water, you need those populations. And when you compare it to something like the, something that gets a lot of hype, like spring baseball training, spring baseball training was only $310 or, or million dollars, uh, uh, during that same year. So it wasn't even close to the amount that's brought in by healthy fish and wildlife populations. Well, you might say, okay, heck, those are just, uh, 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 you know, sport fishing and whatnot. Well, yes, there's a lot of that that is sport fishing. It's a lot native fish, you know, Apache trout and what have you. But also small game, non-game non fishes contribute to desert economies. Let's take a, take a look at Ash Meadows. Ash Meadows is a uh, national wildlife refuge. It's on the edge of Death Valley. It contains uh, what is thought to be one of the highest rates of endemism, uh, unique species that live in the smallest area, uh, or highest density, rather, uh, in North America. So it's a wonderful place to visit. It's a little bit off the radar. People don't know about this. But it's a wonderful place to see. I think it's, uh, it escapes me now. I believe somewhere between 27 and 29 different endemic species, mostly aquatic. It's aquatic springs. Well, this place way out in the middle of the desert, gets 67,000 visitors per year. Okay, and this is according to counts made by the refuge. This is a higher visitation rate than 106 national parks and monuments. Okay? And there they all are. I won't go into all of them for lack of time. And the money generated by local economy, they did some studies on how much a person visiting the same area in Death Valley spends, and this supports the local gas stations, sandwich shops, what have you. It's 49 bucks per person, and that's three, over $3 million per year supplied to the local economy. Now, this makes this, this amount of money makes this equal to about the eighth largest employer in Nye County, Nevada. So when somebody comes to you and says, hey, these things don't contribute, they, they could contribute big way to the economy. Now, in interest of time, um, I would encourage you as uh, biologists and scientists Know how these other desert fish, how desert fishes and uh, other desert organisms contribute in other ways as well. You don't know what's going to uh, 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 sway the public or the decision makers. Products, many uh, uh, are used in medicine, biomimicry. We, we have time to get into that maybe some other time. I won't today. Uh, they are important in many religions. A uh, desert fish, that's a tilapia, it's a St. Peter's fish. That's on the back of the cars you see uh, with the Christian symbol on the back. So that is a desert fish. So uh, these things are important in many different ways. But let's just say, let's just say that these animals had no of those, none of those uses. They weren't good for the economy. There were not a whole lot uh, of other things that there were there, were there uh, to support them. Well, uh, just the fact that they are genetic masterpieces by themselves is an important thing. You see this little beetle right here. Um, a scientist put, uh, um, uh, he said, that tiny little beetle is smaller than a dime. Uh, it's a, a genetic code. If written in a regular 12-point uh, type, would stretch from coast to coast. 
That's how unique that animal is. And uh, when we think about, okay, that beetle doesn't have a whole lot of use, um, you know, I don't see it every day. Well, you could say the same about the Mona Lisa. And uh, people have said these small uh, uh, animals are gen genetic masterpieces. They're unique. They're extremely rare and unique. And um, you think about all the other things in our society, our artwork, um, uh, things like the Hope Diamond. Some of our, I, uh, a person could argue that desert fishes and desert aquatics and uh, some of our desert plants and animals have had more impact on American history than, say, the Hope Diamond. But look at the protection it gets. Um, you know, the Constitution, the Liberty Bell. We know what these things look like. We don't use them every day. Heck, I could probably have a copy of the Constitution. It would be fine. But we recognize that these are important parts of our heritage. We recognize that these are something that we as a society want to preserve. And so the same with uh, many of our natural wonders and our genetic masterpieces. And some people might say, well, heck, why do we worry about these things? Um, you know, uh, we don't have time to worry about them or the resources to worry them. Our budget cuts are, are there. Our, um, uh, you know, we've got climate change coming. There's other important things. And then uh, I would uh, suggest that uh, they look at, uh, during World War II, a very uh, incredibly uh, cataclysmic uh, period in our world history, um, people had time to worry about some of our great works of art, to protect some of these things that our society thought was important. So again, as biologists, as managers, we need to have the ability to say why these things are important and why we should protect them for the decision makers. It's not enough for just our community to know that they are, you know, they're important for us. We've got to expand our audience. So in summary, there are many reasons for conserving desert fishes or whatever species you're working with. In addition to standard ecological arguments, use these reasons. Use them. And why is this important to climate change? People need reasons to, to go out and take climate change on in and, and their own human health, their own self-interest, and these things contribute to their self-interest. So now that we see the value of desert fish, how is climate change expected to affect their population? Let's take a little look at that. Okay. Um, there's been a lot of wonderful research that's been done uh, on uh, uh, fragmentation. Um, you know, Fagan, Minkley, uh, those folks uh, in 2005, uh, Jaeger uh, and uh, Julian Olden's crew, uh, they've done some wonderful things on looking at how habitat is being fragmented with these increased droughts. And so by mid-century, some of their studies show that each year, later on, uh, uh, there's going to be reductions of conductivity for native fishes by 6 to 9 percent each year and up to 12 to 18 percent during spring spawning months by mid-century if things keep going on as they are. And um, is this a problem? Well, uh, according to Fagan's crew, um, desert fish species with the most fragmented historic distributions are five times more likely to suffer local extirpation than those with continuous distribution. Well, Fragmentation is one, increased surface water temperatures are another. Uh, there have been many studies that have shown that air temperature is highly correlated with water temperature. Um, when air temperature goes up, the stream water temperatures go up as well. So that's not too surprising. But the thing is, a lot of people don't realize is the groundwater temperature goes up as well. So these springs, we might think, hey, they're cool, safe havens because they're fed from the ground. Well, actually, you go uh, uh, groundwater is controlled by air temperature as well. And the deal is, is uh, when you go uh, uh, the ground temperature, like if you go in a cave in uh, northern Indiana, the cave is cooler than, say, a cave you'd go to here. And the cave takes on the, the average air temperature of that year, uh, uh, you know, the average annual temperature. And so that's, that's what the, uh, the groundwater is. And so what you have is you have uh, up here, there's the uh, annual mean annual air temperature, that's what the groundwater is. And then when you go deeper, the, t the temperature heats up. And so this is why places like Devil's Hole are hotter. You get that geothermal gradient as you go down. Um, another thing, so rising air temperature will affect those species fed by both groundwater and the surface water. Um, species with competitive advantage in warmer water invade. This is something we're going to talk about a little bit more in detail later, but uh, with burl crayfish, uh, in Arizona, we have no native crayfish species. 
Vero crayfish are a um, are a pest species, and uh, um, they've been brought in, and then um, uh, they are in lots of streams that are state fish. The Apache trout, a threatened species, uh, lives in in the White Mountains in Arizona, and so um, we uh, t uh, these sorts of things and many other species. The ones in the Colorado River and some of the other areas are impacted uh, by uh, changing thermal regimes. And we'll talk specifically about that a little bit more. Therefore, priorities for bi biologists measuring fish habitat. You want to keep water in the streams. That's very important. Keep water in the streams, okay? No brainer, right, for, uh, for fish. And, uh, you all, but you also want to keep water at the correct, and these are usually cooler temperatures for the organisms of interest. Uh, again, with uh, climate change, we're going to be going out of the thermal uh, uh, optimums and suitable thermal habitat for these fishes. So um, let's talk in depth a little bit more about the desert fish habitat research at the University of Arizona. Again, I'm going to concentrate on what, my, what I know. There are some phenomenal research going around out there on aquatics, and I uh, suggest that if you've got time, uh, oh heck! Even if you don't have time, look at it, and you get—you'll uh, see what some uh, folks are doing. Some, some really good work all around. But uh, our objectives are uh, for desert fish habitat research. Here, we want to define appropriate habitat temperatures for selected native fishes at different life stages. When a manager wants to go out there and manage a stream or a spring, they want to know what does that fish need as far as temperature and habitat. So this is what we try to define. The second thing is, okay, you know this fish needs that or that. How do you get it? What are management strategies you can use uh, to improve habitat for native fishes? What are management strategies? Maybe you'd want to reduce habitat for the non-natives, or you want to take out some non-natives. What are specific tools you can use, just like your physician has tools to uh, work with your health and heal you? You need tools too. You don't uh, uh, having just knowing that uh, populations are going to go down is not enough. You've got to have ways to fix it, and so this is what we try to concentrate on well as well. A, a lot of applied research. So first off, when we try to set goals for what temperatures native fish can tolerate, we've done a lot of work on various desert fish species. I'm going to single out the Apache trout right now and tell you some of the findings we have. Okay, well, first off, give you a little bit about, here are some temperature measures of interest to fish biology. Um, there's an upper acute thermal tolerance, and this is what you do is, like, you want to compare fish species, like different uh, uh, fish from, uh, say, different species, different size groups, what have you. You put them in a, um, um, it could be like a beaker or it could be something like that, and you raise the temperature until they flop over and you see when do they lose equilibrium? And then you bring them back down. You don't kill them, but you bring them back down. And that is called a CT max. Um, there's a chronic upper thermal tolerance. Now, fish, they don't usually get these, you raise their temperature in 10 minutes, and you, they, they go over. Uh, they have to survive in a stream for a long period of time, say 30 days, 15 days. And they have to sur survive that under static and fluctuating conditions. And so another type of thermal tolerance is the, the chronic upper thermal tolerance. And uh, we test this by a different method. And then finally, there's the optimal temperature. There's a lot of difference between what a fish can stand and what a fish can live at comfortably, what a fish can grow at comfortably. And so uh, this is another thing of interest. And obviously, you want the fish living in those optimal temperatures, if at all possible. The acute, upper acute thermal tolerance, it's uh, several degrees higher than the chronic upper thermal tolerance. It makes sense, right? A fish can live at, uh, for, say, a minute or two at a higher temperature than, say, it could live for 30 days. And so uh, that's some of the major things. If you see these in the literature, what they mean. So here uh, we collaborated with the folks over at uh, New Mexico State University. Here's some of our graduate students getting together, and they looked at some of the upper thermal tolerance. And these guys are looking at trout. Uh, and uh, um, we've had other uh, scientists here, uh, graduate students, uh, Corey Carveth and Widmer. They were students here for a while back. And uh, Corey was especially interested, are native desert fishes, you know, the ones we have commonly here, more tolerant than the common non-natives? Now, you're, 
you can't just jump, lump non-natives in a group because uh, there's some non-natives that are very tolerant and the other ones that are not very tolerant at all to rising temperatures. So it depends on the species, but we're taking a look at the common species we have here. And here was a surprising result. You would think that desert fish would be very resistant to high temperatures, right? You've got some of those that live in Death Valley at those temperatures up to uh, over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. But there are some exceptions. Some of them are able to handle that. You know, Gila top minnow, desert pupfish, what have you. But many of them are not able to handle as high temperatures as we thought, once thought they might have been. And this is work that, that Corey Carveff did, it published it in Transactions of the American Fishery Society. The thing, and also, many of the common uh, pest species that we have, and some of our sport fish species, are able to handle temperatures equal or higher than some of these desert fish and the, these desert uh, stream fishes. So it's an interesting dynamic and something that we have to manage for when we're managing thermal, to, uh, thermal uh, habitat in these streams. Here's a, a few other things that you might be interested in. How does uh, uh, temperature tolerance vary by fish size? We did some work on that and looked at several species. This is stuff that Matt Rexitar worked on, uh, Matt Ziegler. Uh, we collaborated with uh, the folks over in New Mexico on this. And we find out there's little or no difference in upper thermal tolerance among fish uh, sizes for a variety of species. There is some. There might be a degree or so uh, uh, when the fish gets larger on some of these species we test. And this is for a group from the young to the small adult size. So we don't know what the great big ones, we couldn't test the great big ones in there. But we didn't find a lot of difference. So uh, testing the thermal tolerance of one size group kind of gives you a good picture of what the overall tolerance will be. Now, when you want to test 30 degree, uh, you want to test tolerance of these fishes over a um, extended period of time, um, you need to be able to hold them. And um, there is another thing that you want to test is fluctuations. Uh, streams in Arizona, they can fluctuate widely by 10 degrees Celsius up and down, uh, sometimes even more um, uh, during a day, you know, really hot day, really cold night. So not only do you have to factor in static temperatures, you have to ha factor in fluctuating temperatures. So um, some of our students and some of our staff, I was very impressed they put together this uh, thermal tolerance unit uh, over, over here at the University of Arizona. And so what we can do is we can type in the thermograph of a river or a thermal a regime that a fish might experience, and we can test their effects. It has chillers, it has heaters, that kind of thing, and so we can monitor that. And this unit was described in aquacultural engineering a few years ago. Let's take a look at Apache trout, and you can see here, uh, this is the lethal tolerance 50 right down here at the bottom. This is the temperature at which half these fish die. And so um, the, uh, when we hold them at a set temperature, it's 17 degrees. When we fluctuate it a little bit, the midpoint of that fluctuation is about the, uh, that's again, the LT50. So this is, makes sense. It's cooler. Um, uh, this is what these fish can survive. Uh, but when you get into the summer temperatures, you're talking about a higher temperature. But this provides information to managers and say, hey, we got to keep our streams down below that at minimum. And actually, we want to keep them a lot lower than that because fish, while they can survive at that, here's some data uh, that uh, Matt Rexitar and uh, 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 others worked on uh, looking at growth at the different temperatures. And uh, essentially, um, the, uh, the growth of these things um, is it declines like right when you get to about 19 degrees. So from optimal, you're going to have to lower them even still. And so what this does is it gives the manager the uh, information on what temperatures can we manage our streams at. So the bottom line on this, Apache trout, uh, the midpoint of the fluctuating temperature regime had the same survival as the equivalent static temperatures. So when you're looking at a fluctuating temperature, you're looking at that midpoint of the day and night. That is uh, the thing of interest. Unless that high for the day gets above the CT max gets above what they can take for that uh, small period of time, that hour period of time, okay? Um, the Apache trout eggs, their upper thermal tolerance was 17 to 18. The upper thermal tolerance for the fry was 23, so that up to about the sub-adult age uh, range would be around 22 to 23. 
and of the temperature, the growth was best at these temperatures. So that gives managers a place to go for. Now, we have this information too on some of the desert fishes. Not a lot of them, but a couple of them. You know, spike dace and loach minnow, it's all there. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, look at the work of Kari Carve and Widmer, 2006, 2007, the transactions of the American Fisheries Society. This sets you goals for these are what we have to keep our streams below to support even the survival and for the growth of these animals. But the thing is, is their tolerance, their growth, that's not the only effect of water temperatures. There are very subtle effects that we're only beginning to understand. And uh, so um, uh, what are some of these subtle effects? Well, we learned this. Uh, we have a captive breeding program, which I'll talk about a little bit more. But we've uh, uh, captively bred, for the first time in captivity, numerous desert fish species. And um, the thing that we always see, uh, or is one, there is one uh, big, uh, uh, big indicator on whether these things will spawn, is their thermal regime. We apply the thermal regime that we do in the wild to these fishes, and you have to have an appropriate thermal regime to get some of these fish species to breed. So if you don't have that appropriate thermal regime, the water heating up to a certain amount in the spring, and then it uh, staying there, and then it lowers in the fall to a certain level, then it increases. These thermal triggers we found in the laboratory have been very important for generating spawning. So there are subtle effects we're only starting to understand here. Well, fragmentation's another issue, and I talked a little bit about that before, um, but uh, um, what a biologist in the field needs to know uh, lots of times is how much, what habitat do I need? What are goals to shoot for for a particular species? And this is how you can quantify this stuff. And quantifying the type of habitat, the amount of flow, the, the depth, the substrate, the amount of cover. This is done by developing habitat suitability criteria. And here we're developing some for uh, Cherry Creek in, in Arizona. And what you typically do is you see this uh, little um, grid right here. This is an electrofishing grid. You can put these out, and you have your shocker on shore, and you let the fish uh, come back, and they're over the top of this thing. And then you hit the button. And then uh, you can capture the fish. They're using this specific habitat. You can get flow, you can get depth, you can get substrate, you can get cover, right over this one particular area. And uh, so this is, uh, for habitat studies, this is a great way to do it. You don't have the associated you know, chasing fish that you might have with uh, moving through here with some sort of uh, uh, active electrofisher. And so we develop habitat suitability criteria. You get the available habitat versus the habitat the fish uses. And you can tell, do some fish like really like this green sunfish? Does it like really low velocity water? Do some fish like the speckled dace? Does it like high velocity water? And this is the kind of thing that you can get from that. And I'm going to show you how that can be used here a little bit later in legal cases to be able to protect habitat. And here this uh, information is in tabular form. It gives you the range the, of minimum and maximum of habitat that these things are used, okay, that they're found at. So what practical methods? So we see how these th the temperatures can affect, fragmentation can affect. What practical methods can managers use to cope with the effects of climate change on desert fishes? And um, uh, there, what I'm going to talk about are biological methods. Just a few of them, I'll give it for the interest of time, just give you a couple examples. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about legal methods. This is something that, uh, you know, I sure wasn't familiar with too much as a biologist, but uh, it's going to be becoming increasingly important to understand some of this stuff. And then finally, social methods. Now, as biologists, um, uh, we probably all know some of the, the scientists uh, who are uh, managers in uh, some of the agencies and whatnot. They tell us all the time, say, at the universities or in the research areas, hey, this social stuff is really important. My time is not spent managing fish as much as it is managing people. And you think about climate change, what is it? It's managing people. And so we ignore social science. We ignore these social techniques at our peril. And uh, so I encourage uh, folks who are biologists, managers listening to this, we really need to get up and actively engage in 
than the social science part of it. It's not uh, maybe a few years ago we might have been able to consider it, oh, that's not something I'm interested in. But if we are going to have a positive impact, um, my opinion is we really need to, it's not my opinion, I think the evidence is there too, we really need to engage this and this is, we ignore this at our peril. So habitat modification for Apache trout. Um, we had a student, uh, Apache trout, um, here's their historic range. And with increasing temperatures, increasing use of some of these areas, we've seen their, um, uh, their distribution kind of migrate up the mountain into cool areas. And um, we've got some folks who are doing some really good uh, work with us at Arizona Game and Fish, uh, Julie Carter, Mike Anderson, uh, you know, Jeremy Voltz at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, some folks over at the Forest Service. Um, you know, uh, I can't say enough about what these folks have been doing to save these uh, animals and their, their habitats uh, up there. And so uh, um, my hats are off to them. But these folks have been fighting a battle to, to make sure that, uh, these, uh, uh, that these species hang on, or this species hangs on. And so uh, anyway, hats off to them and, uh, uh, and others who are up there involved in that, in, in that uh, mission. Um, but Joy Price, what she did was uh, she um, worked on um, uh, trying to figure out, okay, you got a stream that's warm, how do you cool it down? What are some potential methods to cool uh, streams containing Apache trout in the White Mountains? And what are their implications for climate change? And when you look at how streams heat, you've got to look at it as a physicist. It's a heat budget. And that's what you've got to think about when these streams heat. And you've got to attack the area where most of the heat is getting in. Okay, when a, when a stream uh, uh, cools, or it's, it's not a matter of talking about the cooling, it's a matter of Buffering it from heat coming in. Buffering from heat coming in is the, what you've got to think about. So there, you can get it from solar radiation. You can get it from inflow, groundwater, surface flow. And then there's heat exchange between the stream surface and the atmosphere. So uh, we're lucky in that there have been and continue to be efforts on developing stream uh, temperature models. And so we decided to use one for Apache trout. This is called the stream segment temperature model. It's a, a uh, it was developed by the USGS in Fort Collins, Colorado. Here are all the reasons we use to check it. It's been on the market for a long time. It's been tested and updated numerous times. It's been used in the field with accurate results. Uh, these components of the model have been well validated. It incorporates most variables that affect stream temperature. It's simple, it's deterministic, and you're able to ground truth and calibrate it. So this is the reason we picked this one. And so um, uh, we looked at four different sites up in the um, uh, White Mountains of Arizona to see, okay, can we try to figure out how to cool these streams, give managers some tools to do this? So what uh, Joy did is she got hydro hydrology input. She picked segments of stream, figured out, okay, the inflow temperature, the outflow temperature of these segments, and then how much of the temperature increased when it went through these areas. Uh, she had set up a weather station on site and measured things that also affect temperature. Uh, air temperature, relative humidity, wind speed, solar radiation, ground temperature, thermal gradient. She looked at the shading capability of the different species of trees we had in the White Mountains to see how they could protect them from the solar radi radiation of the streams. And then what she did is she put this all in the model and she did some calculations to figure out how can stream managers best lower current downstream temperatures of these segments, say one degree, or Given the climate projection, I believe it was six degrees, uh, how could you keep these below the Apache Trout LT50? Okay. And um, again, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, she had a couple of different scenarios she did to keep these stream temperatures below the LT50 if it increases six degrees, which is projected by climate change. So here are, here's what the model looks like, the inputs, and she got all this stuff from out in the field and put it into the model. and looked at when she did some sort of management application, what was the frequency of successful model simulations when she uh, uh, did a certain uh, sort of uh, uh, change in the model. And uh, one of, some of the big things were if you increase the amount of total ch shade or you increase groundwater input, these were some big, uh, uh, big areas that looked like it had a lot of positive results. And uh, shade was a big one. 
Uh, groundwater input uh, is something that we need to look in further, like with, say, cuttings, what have you, uh, in the watershed. But with shading, shading streams is a big uh, tool that uh, managers might be able to use. And so what Joy did is she figured out what trees live in the White Mountains that give the most shade. And she uh, ranked them in de decreasing, say, from the Douglas fir that gave a lot of shade, Engelman spruce, down to the coyote willow. All of them provide shade, but some of them did better than others. Okay. And she went even further and calculated in these stream reaches how many trees per 100 meters would you have to add to lower current, wa air te or current water temperatures below, say, 1 degree or below the climate change, LT50, or to keep it, keep it below the climate change. Here's how much shade you would have to add to those areas. So this was kind of some interesting work Joy did to provide managers with some uh, stuff that they could use on the ground. And here, no matter how many of these, say some creeks, you could add lots of trees, wouldn't make any, wouldn't do the trick. The, uh, you can't add enough trees to make an impact. Here, same sort of thing. In other areas, it's possible. So this is one, one thing that you might be able to do that Joy, a recommendation Joy is giving to managers. So conclusion, streams can be cooled effectively under a variety of scenarios. Shading is a preferred option. And there's a bit investigation of additional options, shading options inside trees and shrubs, artificial uh, shade, deep stream pools, and additional groundwater. These are all areas of future research that might be uh, of interest to check, including uh, watershed cuttings to try to figure out if you can supply more groundwater to the stream. These, all, these uh, cooling streams can affect interactions between species. Sally Petrie. Um, looked at some streams and their uh, uh, habitat and temperature relations between an invasive crayfish and the Apache trout. Now, I remember Jeremy Bolt said to us, hey, just go up there, take a look at those streams. The burl crayfish hang out in the warmer sections. The Apache, Apache trout hang out in the cooler section. He was spot on because here's what you got. Um, uh, the burl crayfish, we found that they were separated to, to warmer areas of the stream the Apache trout did best in the cooler areas. So adding that shading, cooling those streams, not only increases habitat for Apache trout, it improves this dynamic between the Apache trout and the rural crayfish. It forces the crayfish farther downstream out of the Apache trout area. What about legal methods to manage fish habitat? You know, I talked a little bit about that before. Well, we get the habitat suitability criteria, and you need specific criteria to protect streams. Uh, I'm an expert witness in two court cases right now. Uh, the Department of Justice and the U.S. Forest Service are trying to protect in-stream flow for fish and wildlife. And this is, uh, right now, these cases are protection for mining interests who want to pump uh, groundwater uh, and surface flow from some of these streams. Well, to obtain an in-stream flow water right, you can't just go and say, hey, fish need water. They'll say, prove it. Prove what they need. And so these are the actual Arizona laws, uh, statutes. The amount of stream flow required for the proposed beneficial use is needed for in-stream flow application. And here's the devil full pupfish decision. Um, you can keep stream flow or spring flow, groundwater flow, but you've got to restrict it to the minimum amount necessary to fulfill the purpose of the reservation. So in other words, you've got to prove it. You've got to prove that the, these fish need that much water. And here's where the habitat suitability criteria come in. Now, you take a look at this. You see the dash stuff? That's habitat for speckled dace. The blue is habitat for the invasive green sunfish. We took that habitat suitability criteria, gave it to some of Ken Bovey's crew, who is a hydrological modeler up in Fort Collins, Colorado. And this is the stuff that's being used in the court cases to try to say, here's the change that we could expect from a native fish community to this non-native fish pool-loving community if we lower the streams below the riffles. Uh, so this is a very important information that's being uh, used in court. So that's something we're going to be looking at in the future more and more, I think, as biologists is becoming involved in some of these things. Okay, Bre captive breeding to conserve southwestern native fishes. Um, Captive breeding programs are going on now with a variety of endangered species. And uh, we have bred at the University of Arizona several uh, uh, different species of never been bred before in captivity, many of them. And here you can see the, the person, the student, in most cases, who is responsible for it. The publication 
that the, uh, uh, that the method is in. And uh, there they are some more. And then uh, Devil's Hole Pupfish, Olin Feuerbacher was responsible, and um, um, also uh, culturist Jack Ruggiero uh, was responsible here. And so um, all these, again, were uh, ones that uh, we got going before that uh, many of them have never been for, uh, got going in captivity. And we don't look at this as a replacement for um, protecting habitat in the field. Far from it. We look at this as a lifeboat in case that forest fire happens or that spring is dried. It is something that protects the species from absolute uh, extinction. So. Um, Again, uh, we apply different photo periods, temperature regimes to try to get these things to breed in the laboratory. And we uh, use underwater cameras and what have, have you, Amber Shadwan and uh, Jack Ruggiero uh, and Olin got cameras going on to look at how these things spawn. And uh, here's Amber uh, monitoring her camera equipment out of Devil's Hole to understand how Devil's Hole pupfish spawn. And uh, also they built simulation tanks. Uh, to try to spawn these creatures. And the purpose of all this is we have to exactly simulate or as close as possible what these things live in in the field. This is how we get them going in the laboratory. So proper temperatures, proper um, flows, all that kind of stuff. Now this information was used to help in a startup of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Ash Meadow Aquatic Conservation Facility. Um, this is a new facility they built to uh, uh, bring the devil's hole pupfish, help bring the devil's hole pupfish back from the brink of extinction. And uh, again, this is getting a lot of interest. There's Olin and Amber. They're now uh, biologists employed by the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Great Basin Institute. They're working at this uh, facility. And a lot of the information they worked at here at the U of A is being used to uh, try to grow these pure pupfish in the first time in captivity. Well. Again, protecting the habitat is so important, and uh, uh, it's uh, because uh, growing, breeding some of these species in captivity is hard. Um, Devil's Hole pupfish, previous propagation attempts were tried at the Stein Art Aquarium, Mandalay Bay, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, at a variety of refuges. And so uh, these things are tough, uh, and they were not successful. And Olin is finally, uh, and Amber, and some of the folks at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service over there, are finally getting uh, generations of these pupfish to grow in the main tank and to reproduce. And so this is finally starting to happen. It's great news for desert fish biology. Uh, Jack Ruggiero, he tried 14 times, even after running out of funding. Uh, we tried to, we supported him on different, different sorts of accounts and what have you to get Moapa Dace growing in the lab. And after the 14th time, we finally did. And again, this is matching their conditions in the field to as closely as we can to what's going on there. So uh, it's, it's critically important uh, uh, to protect the wild habitat. Do everything you can to keep that habitat intact because captive propagation is not a sure thing. And even if you do, you're matching their habitat. So why not keep their original habitat good? Well, finally, let's talk about the social, um, social aspects. Um, I think many of us can agree that we scientists need to do to better communicate regarding climate change. And here's the stark figure that hit me. 97% uh, of climate scientists and studies believe climate change is occurring, and it's man-made. This is a, a NASA compilation. Uh, that, uh, now, um, uh, I looked at the results of the latest Gallup poll, and no more than 24% of Americans worry a great deal about climate change. You think about something that's affecting our entire planet. And we have people, not only, there's not more than 24% of people, of Americans worry a great deal about it. And that really says that, you know, shame on us, and I include myself in there as well, shame on us for not being able to step out and be aggressive about saying, hey, this is happening, it's happening now, we need to take action, okay? Um, some of the things we're doing here at the university, about underwater fish educating the public. Um, we have exhibits at the Sabino Canyon Visitor Center. They say they're very popular. They're high definition TV exhibits, uh, ultra high def, um, that we bring some of these small species to life to the public. And uh, if you're interested in, uh, this is not gonna be high definition, but if you're interested in one, watch it with the sound on, there's the link uh, to the high definition we have on the, on, the, on the large TV in Sabino Canyon. We hear from the biologists, it's very important 
I went over there and I saw some kids going and looking at it, and they were saying, oh, cool, this is really neat. A we need to bring these organisms to the public and show them how special they are. Also, um, um, for your interest, I've written a book on working with people. It talks about verbal judo, negotiation, how to influence people. Uh, it's available now from Island Press. Uh, if you're interested in this subject a little bit more, then there it is. And uh, um, uh, over the years, I've been uh, impressed by the number of people who have told me that this really, these uh, things really help on working on the social dimension, on communicating with people. Uh, in uh, uh, you know on everything from climate change to managing wildlife to what have you. So anyway, just know that's out there. But uh, um, I guess uh, a couple of final statements here. Um, we will get back to that. 97% of scientists believe it's happening. It's only in the 20s of the public that believe it's a problem. Sometimes you know I'm going to throw in my opinion here. Sometimes I think we might be too timid as scientists on saying, hey, this is going on, we need to do something about it. And I think all this talk about, uh, you know, advocacy versus uh, we can't be an advocate or, hey, we shouldn't get involved in these forums, I think that scared a lot of us off from being able to be proactive on saying, hey, this is going on. And uh, I bring an example in here, uh, which is your doctor. And you think about it, your doctor is an advocate for your health. He or she uses the best data that's available to say, okay, you shouldn't be smoking a pack of cigarettes a day, or you shouldn't be eating all that fatty meat. You need to get your cholesterol down. And believe me, if, we, if I go into the doctor's office, my doctor's sitting there, and I'm sure yours is too, saying, what are you doing here? Are you crazy? Why are you smoking a pack a day? Why are you eating this food? And we, we definitely benefit from that, okay? And I think we as scientists sometimes sit back, not like our, we are physicians, of these uh, natural eco of these ecosystems, this is in human interest to try to get these things brought back to uh, their um, uh, uh, to healthy state. And so we are, since we are the physicians of these things, I think sometimes we need to be a little bit more direct, a little bit more forceful in working with policymakers, in working with the public, on saying, "Hey, we really need to do this for our health," and not just saying, "Here's the data, uh, go for it." So anyway, I appreciate your time, and I appreciate getting the chance to talk with you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I have acknowledgment slides. I have like five or six of them with name after name. Um, again, this research could not be done without the support of many talented biologists and students, and frankly, uh, funding from the various agencies uh, that has been critical uh, to get some of these things done. And so I'd uh, like to thank them here. I'll direct you to our lab's website if you're interested for more information on these particular studies, or you can give me a, a shoot me an email um, at sbonar at ag.arizona.edu. That's sbonar at ag.arizona.edu. Uh, and uh, also you can see the website. That's where the link is for the website, uh, and my contact information is there. So again, thank you very much. and. Uh, uh, I realize that, uh, let's see how we are on time. Uh, it's right exactly at the hour. If you have any quick questions, I suppose I'm okay there, but I'll leave it up to the moderators on that. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Scott. That was a really well-rounded presentation. I appreciate your comments on the human dimensions and social science related to conservation issues. That's something that the Desert LCC is getting more and more interested in. It's interesting to hear your perspectives there. So if if you have time, Scott, we'll maybe take one or two questions. Okay. Okay. So folks on the phone, um, if you have a question, you can raise your hand on your computer by clicking the Participants tab in the WebEx window. And then at the bottom of the Participants list, there's a little Raise Hand button. And Scott, if you could take a look uh, for those and call on someone. And then if Scott calls your name, you can press star six to unmute your line and go ahead and ask your question. Okay, I think John. Let's 
Let's see here. I don't see any hands Wait. raised. I thought John had a hand up, but I don't see that. Okay. I don't see uh, any other questions. Okay. Um, you know what? Let me go ahead and unmute the line in case people are having any trouble with that. The conference is now in talk mode. All right. If, uh, we are up against the, uh, or just past the top of the hour, so I understand people have busy schedules. But does anyone have a question they'd like to ask uh, Dr. Bonar? Hi, Scott. This is Andrew. Um, I was curious how the thermal tolerances of non-native uh, fish, uh, you mentioned that uh, some non-native fish have higher thermal tolerances than native fish. And so uh, what are sort of the uh, implications in regards to the interactions between um, these native and non-native species? Is there going to be increased uh, predation, competition? Uh, could you talk a little more about that? Yeah, you bet. Um, good question. Um, the, uh, uh, what uh, is important to realize is it's not all of the fishes. We can't lump all non-natives and all natives into groups, okay? Some natives are very tolerant of high temperatures, as we discussed. Many of the stream fishes, the natives, like a little bit lower temperatures. The non-natives, the same way. Of the common non-natives we have, some of our sport fishes, some of the pest species that we have here, um, uh, those are uh, able to ha uh, survive equal or sometimes higher temperatures than our native, than our native, some of the native spring, stream fishes. Okay, and so what this does is it's um, um, uh, the fish that's able to to deal with higher temperatures has a competitive advantage. It feeds better. Its physiology works better. It uh, it's more active. It's an optimal temperature for that animal. And so, uh, yes, out competing, um, uh, predating on those uh, other fishes that happen to be there, uh, it's able to out compete, predate on those better. It's, it gets uh, it's, it's better environment for those things to be able to handle. So yes, there's uh, increasing competition. And one final note on that: that's uh, you know when you look at the Grand Canyon, uh, that is uh, one of the concerns of uh, uh, if you warm up the temperatures too much. Will some of these non-natives that are warm water come up and cause problems because suddenly uh, they're able to deal better with the warming waters? And so uh, uh, it is that that interaction is something we were going to have to manage as managers. Great, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. Well, um, folks, you, uh, Dr. Bonar has given you his contact information, so if you um, have questions or think of one later on, you know how to get in touch with him. Um, and Scott, I just really want to thank you again for making the time to be with us today and sharing this uh, useful information. And remind everyone that the webinar has been recorded and we will be making it available on the Desert LCC YouTube channel in the near future. You can find that uh, by searching for um, Desert LCC and YouTube, and it'll pop right up. So thanks, everyone, uh, for being with us today, and I hope you have a great day.